the sea beneath us was noisy. The impenetrable, tarry blackness of the night emphasized the danger. It was difficult to stay long in the cabin. I stepped out onto the holly and leaned against the railing and stared into the void. Suddenly a flash cut through the darkness, followed by another and a third. The yellowish light for a second took the horizon and the clouds in the sky out of the darkness. Light flashes appeared from somewhere beyond the horizon and at an acute angle to the surface went somewhere into the night. After a while, other flashes appeared in the opposite direction, to the right of the first. Then a distant rumble of blows came to my ears. The play of light was repeated, then the rumble began to grow fainter and soon fell silent altogether. I had unwittingly become a distant witness to the night battle at sea. One can imagine how many enemy ships and aeroplanes there will be here tomorrow morning, in broad daylight with full visibility, I thought gloomily. But nothing happened. I don't know if anyone noticed what happened during the night, but I said nothing to anyone, and there were reasons for it. At noon, in order to shorten the way to Gibraltar, we followed the strait between Spain and Baliaramt, and at 5 p.m., already in a calm mood, we passed the islands of Iviza and Pityus, Iviza and the Pityus Islands. On the Mohammed, we were about 200 officers and 1,000 NCOs and privates. With us travelled about 100 members of our families, women and children. The convoy consisted of two ships, and two kilometres behind us was our protector, the British destroyer Keppel. He circled around us like a sheepdog guarding a herd. Only in the morning it became apparent how many of us. We sat on everything we could, lay on the deck, bow and stern. The next day, 26 June, the weather was just as fine and the sea was calm. At 11.30 a.m., a tragedy occurred on the vessel, Pani R. The wife of a pilot evacuated from Bordeaux to England, in a fit of violent insanity threw her three-year-old daughter out of her cabin into the sea and was about to jump in after her, but she was prevented. The charming and sweet girl, as my wife told me later, fell into the water, her skirt opened like a parachute and kept her on the surface for a considerable time. But before the big vessel stopped and returned to the scene of the mishap, the child was already hidden by the water. At noon the icy peaks of the Sierra Nevada emerged from the coastal mists, and by evening we could see the mountains of North Africa to the south. To the west the picture did not change, the bare Spanish coast below the Sierra Nevada. At 10.30pm we dropped anchor in the port of Gibraltar, but long before we saw this characteristic sheer cliff, at the foot of which lay the city, we were feverishly excited. Everyone wanted to be the first to see this rock. People ran from one side to the other, but the rock did not appear for a long time. We saw a hazy strip of coast, which on the right European side appeared to us as a mighty wild mountain range of the Sierra. On the left, African, as a low coulee of calm profile. Thus we sailed on till dusk. This rock appeared somehow suddenly. In the thickening twilight, the outline of a large hulk began to emerge becoming more and more material and powerful, it rose before us in the image of a formidable, irresistible fortress. And we were still 15 kilometres away from it. We had passed a minefield and were cautiously approaching the mountain, which was rising threateningly into the sky. Involuntarily thought how cue there are placed the forces that must defend it, but this, of course, was a deception of vision. After a few minutes of slow walking along the cliff, an unforgettable picture opened before us. Above the entrance to the harbour flickered the thousands of lights of the city, from the foothills to the steep slopes of Gibraltar, and all these lights stretched towards us from the land across the water in long, restless reflections. It all made for a fabulously beautiful panorama. Not a sound came to us. All around us were only wandering lights in the subtropical night. On the 27th of June we stood in port. In the morning the mighty and severe rock was gently caressed by the rays of the rising sun, and it allowed me to have a good look through binoculars at the whole mountain section by section. On the darkness of the rock, I found guns in firing positions, but nothing else. With the trained eye of a military man, I certainly noted places where defences might have been located. At the right end, behind the protective breakwater, the grey-blue bulk of a large warship was modestly placed. It was the line cruiser hood, armed with eight guns of 380 mm calibre and smaller guns. The ship belonged among the strongest in the British Navy, passing the motley tangle of anchored merchant ships. Nimble destroyers cleverly made their way, humming moored and docked ships, and a little aside, so as not to attract attention. 
stood aircraft carrier where every minute landed and launched aircraft. The merchant ships were on the outer roadstead of the port in a widely dispersed order. We remained four kilometers from the mountain. From here we had a good view of the Spanish concentration camp, where prisoners, fighters of the former Republican army, were languishing. Many were said to have died there. In the afternoon, General Viest, accompanied by Colonels Skalinowski Basogo and Gajek, went to the city to greet the governor of Gibraltar. During the day, the Muhammad replenished fuel, food and drinking water. Crates of eggs, frozen meat, vegetables, fruit, sacks of flour and other provisions were unloaded from the schooners. Towards evening, the hood returned to port from somewhere, accompanied by an aircraft carrier. We hadn't noticed it had dropped anchor in the morning. The sight of a warship that was a hidden, formidable force was impressive. On Friday 28, June, on a fine morning, we raised anchors. There were 13 vessels in our convoy, including one tanker. Gradually, the huge rock with its southern steep, as if sloping wall, began to diminish. As we approached the narrowest point between Spain and Africa, the hood, guarded by aircraft from an aircraft carrier and two destroyers, caught up with us. The ship set a course to the south-southeast. At that time, we did not yet know that the squadron was on its way to Oran to soon engage French warships. At that time, nobody knew that the mighty warship hood had a sad fate waiting for it, that on 24 May 1941, off the coast of Iceland, when pursuing the German battleship Bismarck, it would be sunk with its entire crew of 1,400 men. The shells of the first salvo fired by the Bismarck from a distance of 20 miles hit the British line cruiser, penetrated the armour and hit the ammunition depot. The explosion blew the battle colossus into small pieces, so the beauty of the British Navy, the proud hood, ceased to exist. Then, on 27 July 1940, the line cruiser majestically passed us, and we waved to the sailors on board, and they cheerfully answered us. Our convoy was guarded by four destroyers, two in front and two on the sides of the formation. Now we knew that we were going to England. We sailed very slowly. Muhammad moderated his speed, adjusting it to the speed of the slowest ship in the caravan. Before noon, we reached the Atlantic Ocean. Here we had to be wary of submarines. We were ordered to wear a life belt at all times. It was removed only in the dining room. At night, we slept without undressing. For safety reasons, we made a big detour to the west, deep into the Atlantic Ocean. The fact is that to the west of the Bay of Biscay ran a bunch of German U-boats. An English colonel told me in confidence that a German U-boat had just sunk an English ship a few miles away. A strong wind was rocking the Mohammed, but this was not the storm of 13 February 1940. On the high seas, the wife felt ill at ease. She was depressed by the big water and thoughts of U-boats. But Milan and Fred were in their element. They went all over the ship, and I had to look for them all the time. They liked to sit in the stern and watch the water rumble behind the propellers. The good old ship's doctor took a liking to Milan, and he clung to him as if the doctor were a member of our family. On the 2nd of July, we celebrated on board the ship, the anniversary of the Battle of Ziborov. Colonel Sklinovsky Bozy and the playwright and novelist F. Langer spoke. In his speech, the colonel urged us to leave personal quarrels behind and close ranks. A great celebration was being prepared. In the evening, I went to the colonel. I wanted to settle our relations that you knew what would happen to us and for the sake of our unity, it was worth forgetting the past. But the colonel did not accept me. What to do? I only puzzled where this coldness and anger came. July 3 from the ship's radio. We learned that the British sank the French fleet in the African port of Arn to thus prevent its capture by the Nazis, because the French refused to fight together with the British fleet against Hitler. The news brought us a sense of relief. That's what they should do. The next day in the large saloon of the steamer, held a general ceremonial meeting in honour of the Battle of Zborov. Many Englishmen were present. The evangelical priest Horak, accompanied by a piano, recited in English and Czech my poem, I believe. Deputy Uglias remarked that he observed that the poem made an impression, especially on the team. Frantisek Langer, who had left Prague in a hurry to escape the Gestapo, also spoke favourably of my poem. During the meeting, a British seaplane flew over us a sure sign that we were approaching the coast. On the final stretch, close to the entrance to Steed George's Strait, which separates the UK from Steed George's, near the entrance to Tears George's Strait, which separates Britain from Ireland, we faced a special kind of danger. The entrance to the strait was protected from German U-boats by minefields. 
and often in storms, which are the order of the day here, individual mines would break off and become dangerous to passing ships. The lookouts, binoculars pressed to their eyes, stood on the bow of the ship, looking for wandering mines in the waves. Fortunately, we did not encounter any. When we went on deck with the children on the beautiful morning of 6 July, a seagull was sitting on the top of the mast. Frantishka's heart beat joyfully. She had correctly surmised that there was land nearby, and so it was. Land made itself known with a misty cinnamon-coloured horizon and the lazy flight of wandering seagulls in the windy heights of the cloudy sky. That afternoon we watched the competition. First the track and field events and then the tug-of-war competition. Helping our side, we clapped our hands, stomped our feet and shouted loudly. The children amused themselves heartily. Around noon on 7 July 1940, the Muhammad Ali El Kibir dropped anchor in the roadstead of the port of Liverpool. We had entered the soil of England, as once in France, so here I asked myself the question, how would this country receive us? We knew England as a country of the brave, of the strong, of order and discipline. How would we be received here by the big gentlemen and the little people, those who make history? After disembarking, we marched in formation through the streets of Liverpool to the railway station. Dense trellises of residents, old and young children and women, quickly formed along the pavements. The people applauded us, gave us thumbs up in greeting, threw us flowers. Here and there, someone would run out into the roadway and give the soldiers a packet of cigarettes, tobacco or just a gentle handshake as a sign of sympathy. It was very nice of them. After our sad experience with the French, we did not expect it at all. At that time, we could not have spoken of English restraint in showing affection, and though we were separated from France, which was in chaos and disorder only by the narrow channel, we felt ourselves in a different world during the first hours of our stay on English soil. It was immediately apparent that we were in a country where order and discipline reigned. From Liverpool Station, we boarded the railway trains prepared for us, travelled to Beston Castle Station and walked along the immaculate road to Chumley Park, our destination. Along the way, we were greeted in a friendly manner from their gardens by the residents. They gave a thumbs up, wishing us good luck. Joyfully, kindly, they greeted our marching army and asked who we were. Checks, six, was heard around and from their faces you could understand that they already knew something about us. Clean, well-maintained country houses with built-in black beams, covered with greenery up to the roof, gave an impression of coziness. Shortly cut lawns with colourful spots of flowers in the borders invited to sit on them, and to all this, the open faces and guileless looks of the inhabitants. Could we have wished for more? We had come from a decayed, weak France to an organised country, a country determined to fight back against an aggressor. But with what? With our bare hands. Some 350,000 men had reached the island after the retreat from Dunkirk, and all their armaments were the spoils of the enemy. For the defence of England had no guns, anti-aircraft, artillery and above all tanks. The light weapons available to the army, save for a light machine gun of the Bren type, which was produced under Czechoslovak licence, were obsolete, but they were also in short supply. The militia, made up of ex-military men and civilians, armed themselves out of necessity with burdens and sharpened iron bars from park fences. Even historical halberds from museums and family estates were used as weapons suitable for close. In addition, Churchill, in these critical days for the country, sent the only tank division, which could prevent a German invasion of England, to the Middle East to protect vital communications with India. The few ships carrying a cargo of rifles that Roosevelt hastily ordered sent to England were a poor match for the courage of the British. On the way to Chamley Park, we crossed a tree lying across the road. It was supposed to be an anti-tank obstacle, and this in the middle of terrain where tanks could easily move in all directions. It seemed ridiculous, even naive, but it was honest. Actually, it wasn't funny at all. Everything that served defence, the British took with the greatest seriousness. They would fight heroically with all the means at hand, die by the thousands under the aggressor's blows, but they would not surrender. The only thing they could do to repel the enemy was their will and courage. The unbreakable will to resist. That's what the new Prime Minister Winston Churchill had taught them. Instead of Chamberlain's peace for a generation, he offered the British blood, tears and sweat, and a stubborn defence of every inch of land. The will, power, determination and resolve of the whole nation to fight back against Hitler and fight for every brook, every hill and every village combined with the sea made of England, despite its temporary fatal weaknesses, an irresistible bastion.
the white cliffs of Dover, the symbol of English indomitability, more than once sung of in verse and song, formed England's first defensive line. The British trick with fortifications in the south and southeast of the country and successful strategic camouflage completed the cause of the magnificent defence of Britain, catastrophically weak and at the same time irresistibly strong. With the surrender of France, the fate of the world was decided. Ordinary Englishmen were ready then to strangle the murderer with their bare hands. And I admire the people of Wales, famous for the cows of Cheshire, the toilers of London and industrial Manchester, the natives of mountainous, full of charm Scotland. All honest people of the British land. The Channel was indeed for a time a defensive barrier against fascism. Only the Romans reached English shores. Napoleon blamed his failure on the storm, Hitler on the sea but they all forgot their brave hearts behind the white cliffs of Dover. Happy men. On Sunday 7 July 1940, smiling, they were returning from Birkenhead by boat to their Liverpool flats and noisily welcomed us on the shipwrecked Mohammed. And this was after Rotterdam and Dunkirk, after the Royal Oak, Albion's most luxurious warship, with a crew of 1,800 men, lay at scaper flow at the bottom of the sea, after the most brutal war in the history of mankind had broken out in Europe in September 1939. But many in England did not yet take the war seriously, and the Nazis did not yet seem so formidable to them. They may have beaten us up, but that's what war is all about. Amazing people. Meanwhile, our Kazekoslovak ship was being carried on the turbulent waves of the epic, and had already capsized twice. The first time in September 1938, the second time in 1940 in France. How many precious human lives could have been saved if his lordship's long nose had sensed where the wind was blowing before disaster struck? If his majesty's previous office had seen beyond the tip of its nose? How much time and opportunity was lost before those who had a duty to know had an epiphany? From Chumley Park to London. The English Park is a sight to behold. A large expanse, venerable oaks and lime trees growing in clumps, and through them you can see a hilly landscape with paths calling for daily exercise. Pastures and meadows were turned into fields in some places during the war. In 1940, when we settled in the park, golden wheat was sprouting between the trees and mottled cows grazed in their shade. The English oaks bewitched me. The tent city adjoined the trees, and the Czechoslovak soldiers did not live badly here. The equipment of the camp was satisfactory. Here the events culminated on 26 July 1940, the day of the arrival of the President of the Czechoslovak Republic, when 539 soldiers left the army in protest. These were all consequences of France. After the evacuation from France, I held no post in England and was placed on the list of officers without functions. The undeserved fate filled me with bitterness, but my position at that time allowed me to feel more acutely what was happening around and in the men themselves. I saw better the relationship between cause and effect. France was repeating itself. At night, disgruntled soldiers and young officers secretly came to my tent to share their doubts and disappointments with me. There were some among them who wanted to solve everything in the shortest possible way. Relations in the Czechoslovak camp in England were indeed complicated. The citizens of the Republic, who had found a temporary refuge here after the tumultuous events on the European continent, had experienced the demoralizing influence of the defeat of France and the French environment of the time as a whole. Exhausted by the fact that the hope of returning home was fading, people were confused by the rapid change of events and change of views. Ideological differences that had already emerged in France were boiling over. Political and class stratification in the army was deepening. Official and then personal ties began to weaken noticeably. Cases of individual and mass gross violations of discipline became more frequent. In the camp, there was an atmosphere of uncertainty and distrust of some towards others. The feeling of mutual respect disappeared. The negative sides of human nature became active. Honest, patriotic people, and there was a majority of them, experienced the moral crisis of the army hard. These people were looking for methods and means to achieve a breakthrough. The key to solving the problem was in the hands of the army command. However, the command and with it many commanders and staff officers, did not have enough sensitivity and flexibility to realise that the way of thinking and feeling of soldiers in a peacetime army at home, and the spirit of lone volunteer fighters for the freedom of their distant fatherland are two different things, requiring a different style of work, and a different approach to the people and problems of the time, as well as a different heart and a different head. Showing incredible stupidity, 
the then command did not even try to uncover the true causes of the decay of the painful spirit. It simplified its responsibility by looking for culprits only outside its own circle. Its efforts to improve the situation looked a co- The crisis was solved bureaucratically, by written orders and most importantly, by prohibitions and punishments with the total exclusion of personal contact. And people wanted to hear a frank word of understanding, encouragement, condemnation. It Without personal changes, all this, of course, was impossible to realize. So the army command was engaged in administration, in writing strictly steadily. It did not allow other views and ideas and did not require them at all. It knew everything, foresaw everything. It was an authoritarian regime that erected a deaf wall between itself and its subordinates. Such a regime stifled any upsurge, killed the initiative in people. As a result of this regime, it became joyless to serve. Enthusiasm and interest in the work disappeared. With such commanders we lost in 1938. With them we failed in France. As a result of their mediocrity we will end up as an undisciplined unit behind the wire of a concentration camp. Then came the 26th of July 1940. About the mistakes and misconceptions of the army command and some commanders, which contributed greatly to the aggravation of the contradictions, I bypassed my service regulations and on 5 August, through the intermediary of Frantisek Ugliers, whom I met on the steamer and of whom I knew that he was an employee in the office of President Benz, delivered a special report to the supreme commander of the Czechoslovak Armed Forces. In my diary, I recorded it thus. 29 July. In the abandoned camp, the tents are being taken down. With the departure of 539 soldiers, the problem is solved. They are not spoken of, but one can feel how relieved everyone is that they are gone. I have been thinking a lot about this event in the last few days. I felt it was my duty to honestly speak the truth. I did not have the influence to change the course of events, but I can influence their further development with objective information. People of goodwill cannot stand aside. This is about the internal affairs of the Sikislovak part. I will analyze the protracted crisis, the beginning of which should be looked for back in the period of the creation of the Czechoslovak army in France, and hand the materials to F, with a request to hand them to the president. However, this he himself suggested to me. On 5 August in London, I handed my report to Uglids. It was 26 pages long. On the basis of my reasoned arguments, Frantisique Ugliers could report in London to the appropriate persons about the inclination of some Czechoslovak officers towards fascism. Uglis later informed me that the president had accepted my report. In my report, I reported on the reactionary disposition of a number of officers, cited evidence of discrimination against so-called Spaniards, undemocratic methods of investigating and punishing misdemeanors, the incredible bureaucratism of the higher commanders and their staffs, the considerable decline in discipline and morale, and other excesses, disputes, and problems. The report also suggested remedial measures. For example, it was proposed to nominate to command post former fighters of the Interbrigade, with experience and high consciousness, enjoying authority among the soldiers. Back in France, I could not understand why this was not done. I also proposed the necessary personal replacements and concrete measures to strengthen discipline and morale. None of these proposals have been carried out. From the political point of view, the events of 26 July took place in an extremely unfavourable situation, at a critical moment, at a time when Britain alone was confronting Hitler and an invasion was to be expected at any moment. Everything was at stake. The defeat of Great Britain would allow Hitler to concentrate almost all the enormous military and economic potential which the Reich had at that time on one single front against the Soviet Union. The general consensus at the time was that Hitler would attack the USSE in the near future. At that time, the Czechoslovaks' duty to their homeland, their loyalty to a struggling England and the practical expression of a positive stance towards the Soviet Union was not to weaken the anti-Hitler war effort, but to concentrate their common forces on the defence of the island. The events at Chumley were not the fault of any one individual. The blame fell on all. There were gross overreaches on the part of the commanders, but the subordinates did not fulfil their duties either. When the most conscientious part of the camp began to break discipline, it allowed persons who did not take a favourable attitude to our cause, or in time ceased to do so, to frustrate all efforts to remedy the situation. The atmosphere in the camp became fraught with conflict. 
Misunderstanding and intolerance reigned and everyone lacked political foresight and tactical foresight. Irreconcilable contradictions prevented a correct assessment of reality. Maximalist demands and one-sided dogmatic position in the conditions of 1940 could not constructively contribute to overcoming the crisis and the establishment of lasting unity in the ranks of the fighters. The greatest blame falls on the system itself and on those who introduced and stubbornly supported it. It is better not to remember. Everything has its end, bad or good. I waited for it. On the 3rd of August at 4pm, I was leaving for London to see my family. First time in London? The fate of man is astonishing. The train took me to Crewe, an important industrial centre, where I took a fast train to London. This city was of great importance to the defence of the country, and I could see it from afar. There were aerial barrage balloons bobbing all around, and the shadow of a fighter jet on the ground. The county of Cheshire is the first on the way to London. All around, pastures and pastures, divided by fences or hedges into quadrangles, and in them brown and mottled black cows graze lazily in the green. The beautiful animals don't even look back at the train. Tiny patches of oats are lost in the sea of pastures, somewhere the golden glow of ripe wheat flashes. Among the pastures there are small oaks growing alone, in groups or in rows, cows, cows and sheep and dee. Royal oaks in the background of the pastures. All this is Cheshire and the county of Staffordshire. At times the red walls of a farmhouse will flash in the dense greenery, the flower beds will glow, the eye will sink into an English lawn. Lawns in England are natural carpets, densely woven and so delicate you can't even believe it's grass. Probably it is cut under a machine, otherwise you can't explain this softness. As the train travelled on, the countryside continued to glimpse out of the window. We passed through Stafford, past the town of Rugby. Our ambulance roared past Bletchley Station. After three hours travelling through Worcestershire, Northamptonshire, Buckinghamshire and Hertfordshire, the picture outside the windows began to change. The road network became denser, the canal glimpsed in places, and hunting castles looked out of the park. There was less pasture, more cultivated fields and more railway stations. But what are they? The names of stations and settlements have disappeared, signs have been removed from houses and streets, there are no signposts on the roads, adverts with local designations have been smudged, you can't read anything anywhere. Many Hitler's parachutists and agents were neutralised by this technique. Having lost their orientation, the Germans had to ask the locals, which gave themselves away, despite their excellent command of English. They had no use for the stations written in the guidebook if they didn't know where they were. The industrial centres became more dense. The townhouses stood in rows one to one, almost indistinguishable. However, London was still 45 minutes away. We drove into it all of a sudden. As in a colourful kaleidoscope, suburban cottages flashed to the left and right of the train, and then we found ourselves in a dense cluster of typical London houses and cottages, which, as if from lack of light, stretched in height. Businesses, stations, warehouses and streets, overpasses, viaducts and tunnels, and between them houses, houses and houses again, and we were still rushing along, deafened by the rattling rumble of the train, and I could not keep up with the world outside the window. Twilight, the light of the passing day, sudden darkness and light again, and so it went on and on. The grey mass of stone and brick, which centuries had piled up on this dissonant plot of land, was now receding and then closing in on the train, and I wondered when it would come to an end. It was half an hour, perhaps more, before the train stopped, and I found myself at London's Euston Station. Could I have ever imagined that my foot would set foot on this earth? Excited, I stood on the platform for a while and then travelled round about to my destination. I descended into the London underground and then took a taxi in the darkened city. We travelled for a long time and stopped often. The driver illuminated the street name and house number signs. Finally we were at the place. I rang the bell. The doors opened and we hugged. We saw each other for the last time on 13 March 1939. The next day night Emil Strank Muller, Major of the General Staff and Head of the Second Division of the Information Service of the ND Men Dentistry of National Defence, together with Colonel Moravec and his information team, flew to London. This was around midnight. And at dawn on 15 March, the Germans entered Prague. I said hello to Franziska and Major Strank Muller's wife not noticing that Milan was sitting on his bed in the same room, waiting for his turn. But he could not wait any longer, 
and he rushed towards me and opened his arms. A minute later Fred did the same. A few days later I returned to camp. The blitz? Time had passed. The chestnut trees had rusted and the linden trees were almost completely leafed out. On 14 September 1940 I left the gates of Chumley Park for Crewe for the train. It was a quiet, warm, melancholy autumn. I remembered how dryly General Myroslav of Newman had bade me farewell today. He looked at me as one looks at an inanimate object. Unfortunately, at the head of the Czechoslovak army stood a man who, apart from honesty, had no personal regard for any. How could a man of this type unite the divided collective of the camp? I arrived in London quite after dark. I was last in the capital on the 3rd of August. A lot had changed in the meantime. At Oxford Circus I wanted to take the tube, but they wouldn't let me on. The platforms were packed with women and children who were spending the night here on improvised beds of blankets. The women knitted, read, talked. Soon the same fate awaited us. This wasn't the case last time I was here. When I did take the metro and got off at another station, the sirens were just honking the horn. The end of the air assault. Everything became clear to me, including why the train was slowing down in front of London. The taxi driver brought me to a place and told me to get off. It was completely blacked out. You couldn't see a thing. Then someone I couldn't even see clearly told me to get a bus. The bus came, but it didn't take me. I had to wait for the next one. The next one didn't go to Dalege. I only got on the fourth bus, but it didn't take us far. There was another air raid. All the passengers got off at the bus stop near the British Parliament and ran for shelter. I was alone in the street. This was a place I had never been before. Big Ben was rising menacingly right in front of me, and I couldn't help thinking how strange it was to be standing here in the dark during a raid, in the place where England's history is made. I felt eerie in the monstrously huge, seemingly extinct city that covered an area of 4,200 square kilometres. Bright spotlights cut through the night, anti-aircraft guns rumbled infernally, and there was emptiness all around. After lights out, the driver took us to Brixton and dropped us off. It was late and the bus was not going any further. At midnight, a random taxi driver who had finished his shift took pity on me and picked me up. We drove for quite a while before we found Rosendale Road and lit up the number 131 with a torch. It was about one o'clock in the morning when I reached home. In waking up in the morning, I saw an unusually clear sky. London was drenched in sunshine, the still air was full of the sweet smell of autumn, and in the graying crowns of the trees still lurked the tired heaviness of the harvest summer. This autumn did not seem to me some English autumn, for it was very much like our peaceful autumn. But this peace on earth did not last long. Suddenly the sky became a battlefield. In mute amazement we watched from the garden as high in the sky silver flies swarmed furiously around the slower German bombers. British hurricane and spitfire fighters whizzed frantically across the sky leaving behind them intricately intertwined white lines. Fighters suddenly rushed at enemy formations, then fell off in different directions, taking a variety of positions, or spinning, rushing to the ground. And the minute our blood ran cold in our veins at the thought that one of the hurricanes had been hurtling towards the ground for somehow too long, the aeroplane would come out of its dive and soar upwards in an elegant arc. We stood, mute, delighted witnesses of the gigantic air battle for England, and cheered for the heroic pilots. Among them were our own Czechoslovakians. The time was nearing noon when two parachutes opened in the blue skies. Germans. Like puppets, they swayed from side to side, inexorably approaching the land they hated. After a while, they were led past us. We were about to have supper, but as we prepared the food, everyone was in a terrible hurry. Hmm, what's the matter with you? I asked. You'll see for yourself replied Francisca, clearly frightened by something. As we sat down at the table, the sirens wailed. Everyone jumped up and ran for cover. What was the rush? I didn't realise at the time that they were already experienced, and I was left alone at the long table. I'm not leaving here. I mentally declared to myself with all the determination I could muster, and there were reasons for that. Yesterday I had trumped some Lord's Lawn at the Czechoslovak army camp in Chumley Park, and in the evening in the confused maze of dark London, I had groped my way through one of the thousands of streets of the great city. And when at last I found myself at a table of fine food and drink in the deserted dining room of a lodge in Rosendale Road, I had to go. Who would want to leave all that? And why the fear? 
London is so big and our little house is so tiny. What danger is there? But then my wife came running into the dining room, her eyes wide with terror. She grabbed me by the arm and pulled me towards the door. Then I was pushed indiscreetly into the shelter and someone slammed the door behind me. We were in the shelter. This invention was called the Anderson Shelter after a Mr. Anderson, a member of Churchill's War Cabinet, who had reasoned that a dog kennel made of corrugated iron, slightly covered with earth, was a good idea in the front yard. Some people renamed this kennel into a grave, and, as the London experience showed, not without reason. Our grave had an area of four square metres, and the air in it was six cubic metres. That night there were three women, three children Fred sat in a neighbour's shelter, one colonel and three majors of the Czechoslovak army. The shelter was in the garden, fifteen metres from the house, buried in the ground in a seventy-degree arc. Up to half the height the corrugated iron walls were encased in earth. Like herrings in a barrel, we crammed into the black hole of the shelter. I sat at the very doors, stretching my legs through someone else's. Everyone was waiting. I couldn't see Frantishka in the dark. There was silence for a long time. It was the first time I had been in hiding. In Chumley Park, we used to watch the flight of German bomber formations marching on Liverpool at night, standing up and f Nothing disturbed the silence. Was there any point in continuing to sit in this cramped space? Mm. Quiet, it will be soon, said my neighbour. The night is clear. They the expectation of something bad that must inevitably happen, but is not yet happening, terribly unbalances a person. We became nervous. Why aren't they flying? Everyone wanted it to go away soon. Finally the heavens opened above us. The engines roared at the zenith. It was an unpleasant moment, of course, purely psychologic. After all, the aircraft in the zenith was already safe for us. The bomb, which he will now drop, will not fall on our heads, it will fly forward. But what if he had dropped it before, and it was now descending on 131 Rosendale Road? The distance the bomb will travel after the inertia of the bombing is happiness for some and ruin for others. The children were asleep. The batteries near us were making a terrible rumble. When they fired heavy shells, our shelter shook. Then we listened to bursts somewhere far away from us. They came like a soft rumble from the depths of the air, like blows under a feather bed. Then silence, again the blows and again silence. Then a hail of shrapnel rained down on us. They thudded on the roof, clinked against the stones, ricocheted against the drain pipe. It seemed that it was our turn. It was a remarkably clear night. There had been a full moon the night before. I felt the iron wall. It's strong, it'll hold. Some inner voice urged me. It will burst like a shell. Another said confidently, Don't reason and believe. Faith is salvation. I said to myself mentally, If your faith deceives you, what of it? What will happen you will never know. The batteries increased their firing. It was only now that I suddenly realised that disaster was coming, that it was nearer and nearer. The guns were rumbling round, the explosions were deafening, and I was increasingly overcome by a premonition that something would happen to us this night. I tried to make sense of my feelings. I had lived away from my parents since I was fifteen. My mother had died six years ago, but in these moments I suddenly felt like an orphan, seeking protection from mortal danger in the memory of my mother, as if she were my protection. I opened the door of the shelter to see my wife. She was sitting there looking at me. Why does she look so strange? Why is she not at all today like she was yesterday or even a minute ago? The aeroplanes were still over us. Here come the bombs. It feels like they're falling right on your head. The first bomb rips through the air with a sharp impact. Our shelter shook. The second and third bombs fell nearby. All delayed action bombs. One exploded not far from us. Another fell on the seventh house on the left. They're still flying over us. The target of the raid is the Dalagy neighborhood and the airfield nearby. I looked back at the people. They were all looking towards the entrance, as if expecting rescue from there. No one spoke. I tried not to make eye contact with my wife, but at one point I did meet her gaze. There was something in her eyes like a moment of great surprise before the end. The batteries were going full blast. The cannonade merged into a deafening avalanche of sounds, and our ears could perceive nothing. Suddenly, quite unexpectedly, the air shook with a terrifying shock. We all cringed. Then a monstrous force carelessly shook the shelter, lifted it up, and thrust it roughly into the ground again. What was happening to us at that minute, our senses did not register until some time later. Home, shouted someone. 
In an instant, the entire sky in front of us was engulfed in a red glow. But it wasn't ours that was burning. It was the house across the sky. Through the slit, I carefully looked at the outline of our house against the cloudless, moonlit sky. But no matter how much I looked, I could not see any damage. The dark silhouette of House No. 131 was without a flaw. Our house survived, although it was close to destruction. In the ensuing lull, we quickly checked the garden, looking for time bombs. One lay behind a shelter. When it would explode was unknown. There were bombs everywhere. We were trapped. Hour after hour passed into eternity. Soon it will be midnight. An hour is short when you have three days leave, an hour at a time and desperately long when waiting for the light of a new day that will come only five hours later. The main force of the blow was weakening. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. That's all for today, said the colonel with conviction, and began to tell jokes while we waited for bedtime, when they'll cancel the Tevoga, as little Evichka Strunkmuller babbled. Nothing will happen to us any more. Sometimes, however, a sixth sense tells people what to do. We listen to it and return to the shelter. There was silence. Nothing else happened. Suddenly, a lightning bolt of terror struck everyone. I was just looking through a crack in the door. Suddenly, a blinding, cutting light cut through the night, and the deafening explosion that followed shook everyone to the bone. Turned the cracking, clinking of glass from shattered windows, mingled with the rumble of collapsing walls. Our house and everything around it disappeared in smoke and dust, and then came a moment of stupor. Fred. I cried out in horror, half stunned. I crawled out of my hiding place. The thick smoke made it difficult to move forward, and the agonizing fear for my son's life made my consciousness fade. Standing near the shelter, I heard Frantishka sighing heavily. We were both agonizing at this moment. I called out to Fred, shouting as hard as I could into the deaf space. But the answer was only a frightening silence. I could take no more. I could see nothing. I could not orientate myself. I began to grope. But because of my excitement, I could not find the hole in the fence that separated the neighboring garden from the shelter. At last I found a passage, went through it, but did not go any further. What would I find there? The smoke didn't clear. The mangled trees pointed in the direction of the crash site. My mind was filled with terrible visions. Where Fred had taken refuge that night, I saw a deep crater in the ground and nothing else, nothing left of him. I wanted to rush to the spot, but horror seized me and I stood staring into the impenetrable veil of dust where my son had just lived. Pain clutched my heart. But then despair lifted me up. Whatever happens, with a few leaps I reached the garden and D. I saw the shelter. It was intact. I opened the door with a jerk and shout. Hmm. I woke him up. Fred had slept peacefully all that wild night in the shelter alone, and his sleep had not been disturbed in any way by what had happened. The primitive shelter of Mr. Anderson's system had proved to be reliable. Then came the rain, but it was not water from heaven. The fine dust raised by the explosion was now falling like fine spring rain on the trees, frozen in the windlessness. So, at 23.30, a thunderous explosion ended the strongest so far raid on London Hitler's bombers. That night a record 183 enemy aircraft were shot down. The civil defence reported that in our area alone in Dalijar about 500 houses were destroyed. The scale of destruction was increased by air mines which the Germans dropped on the city on parachutes, one of them weighing a tonne, exploded not far from us low to the ground and with its gigantic blast wave crushed the lighthouses like boxes. The upper floors collapsing destroyed the floors below. After the Dalijar disaster only ruins remained of the houses but the ineradicable English humour lived on. I witnessed this scene this morning. On the first floor, braces were hanging on a hanger on the remains of a collapsed wall. They fluttered in the wind and were the target of jokes. The owner of the braces was laughing at the sad victims as he strolled by on the bill of his pom-poms. We had lost our shelter. After dinner, which cost us all a pound sterling, we slept on the floor of the basement restaurant of the Cumberland Hotel, near Marble Arch, but that same night, the shrapnel of anti-aircraft artillery shells showed us that even here safety was a fiction, for the vaulted ceiling of the restaurant was only a glass dome beneath the heavens. Then we entrusted our lives to the London underground. Happy, we fell asleep to the rumble of trains on the stone floor of the platform. But after the mass deaths at the neighbouring station, where a bomb had punctured the upper floors, the confidence disappeared here in the bowels of the earth. Now there was no longer anything left to shelter securely.
nomadic life had come for us. From night to night, from place to place, holding Milan by the hand in our arms or on our backs, we travelled with the onset of dusk in search of a safe place. As once before, in January 1940, when we were fleeing, the little hands would again wrap themselves tightly around my neck. It happened that we were late and ran for cover to the accompaniment of anti-aircraft batteries, and we were threatened by shell splinters. But life did not give up. Again and again we fought to preserve it. On 16 October 1940, Francisco was at the end of her strength. That morning we walked out of the shelter into a sea of fire. It couldn't go on like this. We had to get the family out of London. The very next day we left the capital and drove to Crewe near Liverpool, where we spent the night before continuing on to Beeston Castle. There was just about a heavy air raid. At the station hotel we climbed to the wooden steps of the wooden building, which creaked pitifully, as if in fear with every step we took. We were also in fear. Would we be able to get out in time if the hotel caught fire? In the morning we were already sitting in a cosy, English-style room of the vicar's couple in Banbury, a small village in the county of Cheshire in the west of England, tracing its origins back to the X century. We were 350 kilometres from London Hell. Enough and yet not enough, as we discovered later. When we entered, Mrs Vickers was knitting, wood crackling in the fireplace, an antique clock on the wall ticking away the time. There was a shaggy dog lying on the flowered rug that covered the floor. He did not get up, nor did he growl, but glanced at us. In the garden the dahlias were blazing brightly, and the fresh English lawn was inviting to a walk. Then my gaze rested on the wooden shelf by the fireplace. There were about a dozen pipes, each in its own nest, in strict order of rank. I could not believe that this forgotten world was real. In London, the fighting was fierce. People were dying and their houses were burning. In Banbury, on the other hand, there was peace, both in people's souls and on... The master of the house, the master of the fort, Mr Vickers, came in. He wore a tweed suit, a cap and high boots on his feet, blonde-haired, smiling. In the clear gaze of his blue eyes there shone a peculiar sort of ingenuous walled pyre naivety that seemed to illuminate him from within. He was a farmer on a plot rented from a local lord. He had a cow. Other than that went somewhere for service. He received us simply. Beneath the neutral appearance there was genuine kindness, restraint in expressing feelings. Human in character he was a man who understood the needs of others. He was a man of few words. Don't worry, I'll take care of them, he said. And that was all not a word more. He added only a discreet smile, and his eyes glowed with warmth as if to confirm his feeble words. I can be at peace. He has taken over the care of them. He will worry about their safety. I looked at the glowing embers of the fireplace and mentally said to myself, what a man, simple, all glowing. That same evening I returned to London with a light heart. There, without a moment's slackening, continued the fierce battle for England. What a small thing can play a fatal part in the fate of a man. Ducked to the sight, lies in the cockpit of the aircraft German navigator Bombardier, closely watching the target, lit by the full moon. Now, now it is necessary to press the button. The bombs would detach and fly down, exactly on the target. At that moment the heavy bomber suddenly shook. It was hit by a piece of anti-aircraft shell. The pilot was also frightened. The object in the aiming device deviated from the desired position. For a few seconds, the aircraft levelled off. The navigator found the target. The bombs flew to the ground. In half a minute, the messengers of the humanist culture of the 20th century will sow death and destruction among the people on Earth. There used to be such a pretty street in London. Small houses like toy houses, with gardens around them, and in the houses, human happiness. Now that street is gone, and the happiness is gone too and never will be. All that's left of the street are ruins, and under them lie people, adults and children. Do you hear that? Children lying under those heavy blocks. Children who are not guilty of anything, children, who said, oh, I wish I could grow up. Scream, scream. Let the whole world know that beneath these piles of stone and brick lie children, tender children, smelling like wildflowers. Maybe among them is that blonde-haired little boy who sat on his father's lap and said, Daddy, I'm afraid. And do you know what his father said to him? Don't be afraid, son. London is so big and our cottage is so small. He told him that, rocking him on his knees, and little John believed it. And then disaster came, and his lips were forever numb. No more will the boy tell how he felt when the world was crumbling over his head. 
Nor will his mother call out to him, my dear boy. The beams of the destroyed house fell on the curly heads. The tender hands were crushed by the terrible weight of the stone grave. And so the children lie there in a street that no longer exists. Five hundred meters away from the street is a large park, a typical London park. Few trees, lots of grass, beautiful paths. Bombs would have fallen on this park if... Yes, if the pilot had steered the plane smoothly and the bombardier had kept a precise direction on the target. Instead of destroyed houses and dead people, only the ground would have bled from the impact. Maybe a tree would not be green anymore, but a mother would not lose her child and her spouse. I wanted to shout to the whole universe with grief for the murdered children in all corners of the world. Lalem, Lalem, why are you so close to me? I returned from Banbury to my son in London on 18 October 1940. For two days Fred lived there all alone. I was afraid for him, and with good reason. German fighter planes were so brazen they were coming into London in broad daylight. They would rush at a chosen target or, in unfavourable weather, through a veil of fog, throw bombs at the city at random. There would be an explosion, and only when the fighter had already gained altitude did the people realise that an attack had taken place. In the evening the bomber formations arrived, and then the scorcher began. Anxiety followed anxiety. The area around the Cumberland Hotel, not far from the opulent marble arch, which no one still knows what it is in honour of, was devastated beyond recognition. Good thing Francisca and Milan were out of town. When I returned to London, the train dragged extremely slowly, or perhaps it seemed so to me because of the excitement I felt for Fred. I found my son in the ephemeral sanctuary of the hotel. Leaving one, I returned to the other. On the 22nd of October, Fred left London for a new school in the province. He had just turned 16. Cornwall School at Camberley had made good preparations to welcome our children to the Bohemian School. Fred will now be safe and healthy there. Yes, safety for children is first and foremost. After my son's departure, I was orphaned. Our family was now in three different cities. London, Banbury, Camberley. The nights in London were bad. The head fog behind. At the insistence of my wife, who asked me not to stay overnight in the flat, I would go to the underground in the evening. This was where the regular clients gathered. This was where those who had no safer and cosier refuge came. This is where the people of London came. When there was an air raid, a dense crowd would rush down the escalator. Even as you pull off, the stale, exhausted air hits you in the nose. The platform is jammed, people sit shoulder to shoulder, lie down, wrapped up in plaids and coats. The elderly are dozing in various poses. Small children are running around exhausted mothers who pay almost no attention to their children. Occasionally there is a loud cry from a child, but even the older women don't care. They talk, knit and red, as if they were at home in the silence of the room. Next to a young girl with coral lips, an old man lies on the floor. His veins are blue and swollen. He is not well. Next to him is a paralyzed man. T2 wants to live. The underground is presented in its full nightly cast of characters. The people are silent, withdrawn, amazing people. In quiet heroism, they accept things as they are. We must endure, they say, but they will pay us for it. At Marble Arch, Lancaster Gate, Queen's Road, Notting Hill Gate, Oxford Circus, Bank Stations, everywhere the same picture of mass suffering and determination. A hellish night passes, and in the morning people go to work as if nothing had happened, and the next night they lie down again on the bare slabs of the underground. Later they will be given three-story folding bunks, but there are not enough for all of them. And in the evening there is a prostitute on the same corner again. People in cafes sit in their usual places, and children prepare their homework. Life doesn't give up in the thinned streets, it continues to pulse. People put up props to the house, put up the British flag and go about their business. In France, the law of life led to surrender. Their one wanted to live for the sake of life itself. Life was valued more than the nation, more than France itself. In England, life was kept alive to save the country. On the 10th of November, I moved into the one-room flat of an actress. The landlady had preferred to go to tranquil Scotland. The rent was not particularly high. From the sixth floor of a modern apartment block on Kensington Park Road, I could see the chimneys of the houses on the opposite side. English chimneys have a poetry of their own. They have up to five pairs of superimposed clay chimneys sticking out to improve the draft, 
and hardly two of them are the same shape. Therein lies their charm. I reclined in the luxuriously upholstered armchairs and played the piano. Then the raid began. It was the first raid I'd had in my new flat. Above the roofs of the neighbouring houses the whole sky was lit up with flashes of anti-aircraft guns, their volleys merged into a continuous murmur. New shells, which the British fired at the German planes, burst, scattered myriads of stars. The moon illuminated the roofs of the houses with a dead pale light. In a number of houses, instead of walls, a crumbly notch was left from the bomb explosion. Below lay a pile of rubble. The magnifying glass peered into the exposed gut of the surviving rooms. The night was glorious, cloudless. The Germans had struck twice that night. The civil defence men urged the tenants to go down to the shelters, but I could not leave this seductive flat. Bombs exploded. Then there was a deafening bang, and the big house shook. But I stayed in the room. On the ruins of one house I read the next day a scrawled inscription. Hitler will not take away our son. Londoners read the inscription and smiled. Every day after six o'clock in the evening the whistling started. The guns did not stop, and wave after wave of bombers came to London. This time I did go down to the shelter. The newspapers were reporting a big German raid on the city. Other reports said that reservists had been called up in America, and soldiers were on their way from Australia to help their mother country. The forces were consolidating. This was already encouraging. In the crowded hall of one London Danzinger, 18 November 1940, an aerial bomb exploded. The surviving musicians immediately played a popular song, Cast Away Your Worries, and then sounded National England Will Always Be. While rescue efforts were underway, the visitors, including the injured, sang along. My family nearly moved again. It's a long way to Banbury, and the railways in England are expensive. Instead of travelling so far and seeing your family so seldom, it would be better to rent a nice little house, fully furnished. Three steps from London for nothing, my friends told me and advised me to go to Staines, west of London. From there, they said, it is not far to Camberley where there is a Sikh school. My son would be close by and London would be just a stone's throw away. It was tempting. In November's bad weather, I travelled to Staines. There were plenty of offers at the letting office. The neighbourhood of London didn't seem safe enough for the cottage owners, and they preferred to leave it as it was. The price of rented accommodation had fallen considerably. That suited me just fine. The girl at the bureau put the rental adverts on the table. Laylam, 14, Moorhayas Drive. Four rooms, bathroom, kitchen. Three Laylam, 86, Staines Road. Three rooms, bathroom, hot and cold water, one parlour, gas, electricity, the ceilings of one room reinforced, the outside walls of the house covered with sandbags, a garage, a fine garden, and in it an Anderson shelter. Only three and a half guineas a week. It was altogether cheap. There was another offer from Staines. A whole unfurnished villa was offered for not less than three years for pay 75 a year. Me, shipwrecked, a big villa for that long? Good joke. Ridiculous. Really. I marvelled at the owner's foresight, so he predicted the war would be three years. Well, that's not a bad prediction. Lelem, Lelem. The name didn't tell me anything. You'll be there in an hour. The girl assured me. I stopped under an oak tree whose leaves had already withered and turned brown. I guess that's why the tree didn't seem so big. It was raining lightly. Sometimes in the gaps of grey clouds saturated with moisture the sky turned blue, and then the water in the pond turned blue. Then the sky darkened again, clouded over, and it rained again. English weather. Arriving in Laylam, I was immediately in the countryside. A real English village with its idyllic tranquility and manicured nature. As if mesmerised, I gazed at the ancient stone church, to which an overgrown path led. When I noticed the wicket in the low stone wall, my heart leapt with joy. It was as if the Beskids, my village with its charm of hewn roofs, belfries and gates, were looking at me. Wallachia. Behind the gates with the hewn roof is a dense spruce forest. Real seekly spruce trees had travelled here near London, from Czechoslovakia. I stroked the prickly fir trees with trembling hands, breathing in the scent of home that came from them, and I had the feeling that it was Christmas, even though there were no candles on the fir trees. Between the willows and alder trees the teams sparkled and twisted, and a whitish mist rose from the groves along the river. The house to which I had been sent stood on a hill. It had a divine view of the river. The plain rose and fell smoothly, as if in soft waves. 
Trees grew along the banks of the river. The meadows and groves of the Thames beckoned. One living room overlooked the Thames, the other the manicured garden. It's very beautiful, praises the master of the house. And all for three and a half pounds, that's so little for such beauty. And then Mr. Wolf asked if I had a banker of my own to vouch for me. I did not answer at once. When I spoke, I did not recognize my own voice. Mr. Wolf, I said, I can only vouch for my honor. A man who does not have his banker may have it, and I'm not sure that every man who has a bank account has it. My dear fellow, through no fault of my own, I am here. I think you yourself know who is responsible for our collapse. Otherwise, no one would be incredulous if you asked me who I was. And you, Mr. Wolf, with your fertile indifference, should realize that you don't run across the border with a container of furniture and a safe... A terrible night in Banbury. On the 28th of November, I went to visit my own at Banbury. The big railway junction at Creel, from where the branch line to Beston Castle runs, was heavily bombed that night. The Germans made raid after raid on Liverpool and extended their sphere of action to the area of Crewe and its neighbourhood. Trains were not running, railway personnel sat in shelters. More and more German air force formations raided the towns of the region. When there was a relative lull, the train slowly moved towards Beston Castle. From the darkness of the carriage I looked out of the window into the blackness of the night, which hung in the air like a black blanket on a stretcher with a dead man on it. Then suddenly a strange cold light spilled across the sky, making the landscape outside the window look ghostly. I watched the shimmering glow, but the source of this light remained a mystery to me. At times the water in the pond sparkled. A star glimmered in the gap of the fast-flying clouds. The villages lay dark, as if extinct. Sheaves of sparks passing behind the closed window. Clouds of locomotive smoke. The uneven clatter of the wheels of the cautiously running train. All this aggravated the eerie feeling that we were slowly rolling somewhere into the abyss. Then round the bend the sky in front of us was lined with flare bombs on parachutes. That's where that mysterious glow was coming from. Explosions were heard. Around the railway bed incendiary bombs were smoking in the meadow. The station was covered with them but more were falling. I ducked between them and ran into the field. After the incendiaries came heavy, high explosive bombs... What was it that the Krauts had thought of throwing bombs on a farmer's land, subjecting lost villages to a massive attack? The night shook with resounding blows. For a while I trotted along the road to reach my goal, then I slowed down, remembering to look around for traps. The towns of Crewe, Chester, Whitchurch, Tarpley fought by searchlights in an unequal battle with the night pirates. Unarmed Banbury was attacked by the enemy in pitch darkness by mistake. There's the house. I rang and knocked happy and strangely free, as if everything, everything at once had receded and only our peaceful life of peace and safety remained. But I knocked in vain. Nothing moved. I don't the unlock. Then I had a saving thought. I whistled a well-known Czech song. The door opened cautiously and Mr. Vickers appeared on the threshold with his gun in his hand. All this time he had been keeping a lookout for the German parachutist who had been walking round the house. He was very much surprised when instead of the German I appeared before him. Under the stairs both women and children huddled together in fear of the jerry and Stanley was determined to sell his life dearly. The next day the irreparable almost happened. That morning Vickers and Milan were surveying the area after the raid. On a neighbour's property, a huge bull, dazed by the bomb blasts of the previous night, came upon them unexpectedly. Stanley managed to throw Milan over the fence and at the last minute jumped after him. One more second, and we would have lost Milan. In the crater from the bomb, which fell 300 metres from the vicar's cottage, a lake 10 metres wide and 4 metres deep had formed. And there were many craters in the field like mushrooms after rain. Christmas 1940. Christmas was approaching. Already in November I began to think about how I could give my children a wonderful, unforgettable Christmas. After all, it was the first war Christmas in a foreign land. I wanted to make up for the loss of their home, to please Francisca, our hosts and their children. After all, we owed this family a roof over our heads. It was a lot of trouble, but it was the kind of trouble that makes you young at heart. I went round one shop after another, choosing gifts with pleasure. The assortment was rich, the prices were still peaceful, the quality was high, there was plenty to choose from. At Oxford Circus I saw a customer looking at a toy car. I was stunned. It was exactly the same technically perfect car that Milan, to his great dismay, 
had to give up in Welk. The little boy never stopped regretting this loss and longed for his car all the time. I would have paid anything to get it. It was the last copy, and the customer could not make up his mind whether to take the car or not. For a minute the customer put the toy on the table, and I, without waiting for his final refusal, grabbed the car, paid in a flash, and rushed away, taking away the precious booty. On the way I was already thinking about how the car will come from Velka to Milan to England. The English don't know Christmas magic. They give out presents in advance throughout December. They have no weakness for Christmas trees either. Thus, the Christmas Eve festivities are lost in the mundanity of the day. Our hosts were to become familiar with the Christmas Eve celebrations of our custom. I had travelled from London to Banbury laden with presents. Only a small artificial Christmas tree and some trifles I had bought in Chester. I kept the programme of the evening a closely guarded secret from the household, but there was a pleasant excitement about it, and I was again as quiet as if it were nothing to do with me. About five o'clock in the evening I threw everyone out of the room and began to prepare for the evening. Time passed in tense expectation, and then the bell rang, announcing that our Mikula had come, that he had brought presents in a sack, and that he must hurry up and go on, as he had a lot of work to do on such a day. In our family traditionally our father summoned us under the Christmas tree, and I kept this custom. Milan opened the procession. He was followed into the room by Mr. Vickers and his wife, followed by Francisca and Fred. On a table in the middle of the room next to the British and Czechoslovak flags stood a decorated Christmas tree with candles burning on it. Under the Christmas tree on the table, and on the floor on the carpet, were packages and bags tied with beautiful ribbons. The shocked spectators sat down in their chairs and did not know what to look at. Their eyes were scattered. This was not their custom. We made mutual toasts. Mr. Vickers wished us a speedy liberation of our homeland. I wished him every blessing. The women could not conceal their emotion, and the landlord himself wept. And they say that the English are cold people. So our landlord was an exception. In the spirit of our old ritual, I asked Stanley to distribute the presents. Milan, as he unwrapped his presents, was burning with excitement. He took off his jacket and then his jumper because he was so hot. A big box in it, a smaller box, then a smaller box, then another smaller box, then another. Lots of paper in the boxes and nothing to see. In a hurry, he threw away the empty boxes and finally reached a small, modest box. He opened it, jumped up, splashed his hands and shout. Car! Then he gently took the toy in his hands, pressed it to his chest and forgot the whole world. When I leaned over the sleeping Milan at night, his cheeks were red and he was clutching the little car in his hand. Hell over the city. On 29 December 1940, a Sunday, I was writing New Year's greetings to friends. What I had not had time to write before seven o'clock in the evening was no longer written. Suddenly the air was filled with a terrible rumble and Luftwaffe formations were coming at London in a steady stream. The scale of the attack foretold the dimensions of the disaster that was approaching the unfortunate city. The night fighters took an unequal fight in repelling this attack. They could be heard manoeuvring at high speed to take the enemy bomber at gunpoint. Bomb after bomb lay down in the neighborhood of our high house. Thunderous blows shook the air. Inside the house everything was crackling. Not far away, Staples Cathedral towered above the surrounding houses. Bluish and reddish flashes illuminated its dome. The silhouette of the temple loomed like a symbol against the sky. Only half an hour ago the impenetrable black night suddenly brightened and a strange pink glow flooded the whole sky. The darkness was replaced by an unnatural twilight that resembled an eclipse of the sun. Six bombs exploded, one after another, not far from our hiding place on Kensington Park Road. One of the bombs fell very close to our house. Paintings swayed and hit the walls. The piano made groaning noises. I quickly got into bed and suddenly felt everything in me and around me tumble from side to side. The bizarre light never faded. The window facing west could not see what was happening. Driven by curiosity, I stepped out onto the flat roof of the ninth floor where the civil defence observers were. What I saw was beyond description. It could only be compared to the phenomenon of solar prominences. In the east, the sun was glowing. The entire horizon from left to right was ablaze with fire. The tongues of flame reached enormous heights. The city was burning. Thousands of buildings housing shops, banks, offices, warehouses were burning. In an area of about four square kilometres, everything was destroyed. The fire, organised by Goering's aviation, 
which as a result of Sunday's mass raid dropped tens of thousands of incendiary bombs, caused catastrophic damage, as the Nazis were well aware of the specific features of life in the city. There were about half a million people here during the day and less than 5,000 at night. The commercial and industrial centre was empty after the end of the working day, and at the end of the week a few hundred people remained here. Shops, offices and firefighting facilities were locked on Sunday evenings, and firefighters lost a lot of time while they penetrated houses and got on roofs to put out incendiary bombs. To contain such a fire while simultaneously bombarded with high-explosive bombs proved beyond their strength. The city was reduced to ashes. On New Year's Day, the third day after the fire, I took the metro to Steeples Station to see what was left of the city. I could smell the smell of burning while I was still in the subterranean rooms of the metro station. The underground building had burned to the ground. The only floor that remained was the one that covered the local fires from above. I wanted to see Seapool's Cathedral. When I asked a citizen for directions to the cathedral, he looked at me strangely and silently pointed in a direction. I looked in that direction and saw an unforgettable picture, above the smoking wreckage of the houses, half shrouded in a smoky haze. The majestic dome of the cathedral rose high into the sky. On its highest point gleamed a golden cross. The temple stood untouched, just as it had been centuries ago. Around it for almost a kilometre week were only bare walls with burned holes through which grey smoke lazily drifted. Numerous crowds of Londoners wandered around the destroyed city all day, stood pensive and walked on in silence. It would be wrong for anyone to mistake their calmness for indifference. These men with a pipe in their mouths remembered well what they had seen. Another thing was incomprehensible. Hitler's idiotic misunderstanding of the character of the British. After all, on many examples the fascists could make sure that the inhabitants of the island empire do not react with fear and panic to enemy attacks, aimed against their fighting spirit. The Nazis already had enough evidence that the barbaric way of waging war against England is ineffective. And despite this, the Nazis destroyed Coventry, burned the city, allowed other mass atrocities. This cannot be explained other than a blind lust for destruction. Hitler's deputy Rudolf Hess assured the German people that the British now have one concern, how to push back the deadline for certain defeat. He should have listened to the conversations of ordinary Englishmen in the streets, in the factories. On the trains, the English are not the French. In one of the former main shopping streets of the city I stopped, amazed at the devastation produced, the thaw. And five-storey houses on either side of the street had been turned into piles of bricks, and through the openings formed it was evident that the houses which stood beyond the red line of the street had also disappeared. The picture was the same in other streets. One cloth shop had miraculously survived, only it didn't have that note on the door, open as usual. That inscription on the door meant much more now a brave, indomitable English character. The city fire of 29 December 1940, seen by me from 15 kilometres away, made a lasting impression on me. The Soviet Union will never forget it. Hitler, who in a brazen speech in August 1941 announced to the world that he had given the order to stop munitions production because the German armies in Russia were not meeting proper resistance and the roads to Leningrad, Moscow and Rostov were open. The same Hitler in December 1941 tearfully cried out to the German people in December 1941, urging them to produce as many arms and ammunition as possible. Schaft, Waffen, Schaft, munition, 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 Hitler hysterically shouted at his countrymen, begging them to triple their efforts to produce arms and ammunition. The unusually bloody battle for Moscow, its far and near approaches, which broke out in September 1941, ended in early December with the Soviet counter-offensive, which lasted until April 1942, in difficult, extremely difficult and harsh conditions. The Red Army fought this battle, not even having numerical superiority over the enemy, and for the first time in six months of war inflicted a serious defeat on the main grouping of Hitler's troops, such a defeat that Hitler began to call for help to the entire German people. German troops were thrown back from Moscow for 100, 250 kilometers. 38 German divisions suffered a heavy defeat near Moscow, especially heavy losses were suffered by tank armies of the enemy. In fights on the outskirts of Moscow, the enemy lost its striking force. Hitler's command did not expect such heavy losses, and therefore in the December days of 1941, it had neither forces nor means to conduct major offensive operations. 
heavy losses in the winter of 1940 and FTE2, and the fact that the strategic objectives were not fulfilled, led to the fact that the German command was forced to gradually weaken in the first months of the new year, the defence in the West. It hastily transferred large reserves from France and from other fronts to the areas threatened by the Soviet counter-offensive. This alone helped to stabilise the Eastern Front. In the spring of 1942, both sides were preparing for major operations in accordance with the prospects of war for the current year. The Soviet Stavka, headed by Supreme Commander-in-Chief I.V., Stalin envisaged a major operation on the East V. Stalin assumed that the main offensive operations of the German command would begin most likely in the Moscow direction, then in the south of the country. In the spring, Hitler again stated in a boastful speech that as soon as the roads dry up, the German grenadiers will march to finally and irrevocably conclude the war in the East with victory. For the immediate period of 1942, Hitler's military strategy counted on the defeat of Soviet troops in the south. In the areas of Donbass, Kharkov, Kiev, the occupation of the Caucasus, access to the Volga and the capture of Stalingrad, the achievement of these goals could practically equal the destruction of the Soviet Union as a state. This was a mortal threat, and therefore the Soviet command was preparing for heavy clashes with all its forces and means. All resources, both military and political, were thrown on the scales. The most effective form of assistance to the Soviet Union during this period would be the creation of a second front in Europe. The leading statesman of the anti-Hitler coalition Churchill and Roosevelt promised to open such a front as early as 1942. Hitler's command, endeavouring to maximise the force of the main blow, was removing everything possible from the other fronts. A second front. Back in 1942, that was the decision. However, nothing in the West said that such a front, despite the promise made, would be opened in time. It had to be fought for. But how? Everyone fought to the best of his or her ability. At the Oxford University Debating Club, to which I was invited on 20 December 1941, I gave a lecture entitled The Battle for Moscow and the Prospects for War in the East in 1941. The main issue of my lecture was the reasoning behind the necessity of opening a second front as early as 1942. In the same spirit I spoke on the BBC in London on 19 June and 15 October 1942. But words remained words. What was needed was action. The Soviet ambassador in London, Bogomov, and Colonel Sizov, the Soviet military attached to the Czechoslovak government in London, spoke about this. What lay beneath the phrases about preparations for the opening of a second front, and what was the actual strength of the German defence of the Western Rampart in France? In 1941, I headed the research team of the 2nd Division of the Intelligence Service of the Ministry of National Defence. In London, the head of which, and at the same time Deputy Morovec, Chief of Intelligence, was a famous intelligence officer, a modest and peculiar man, Major Strunkmuller. My task was to check and evaluate the information, ours and others, which was supplied by the agent's network, to make operational and strategic conclusions on their basis. I was aware of everything that was going on. I knew that the Soviet Union was facing a severe test. I foresaw, and not without reason, that the Second Front, promised in 1942, will not be opened. The defensive rampart in the West, say, very strong, and the Allies are not yet ready. At the same time, Hitler was withdrawing divisions in France and sent to the Eastern Front to compensate for the huge losses and prepare for a decisive blow. Calls for the opening of a Second Front were louder and louder. Everything said that a decisive battle was brewing, and it was the most appropriate moment to provide effective assistance to the Soviet Union. The monstrous scale of destruction on the Soviet-German front depressed me, and I planned to collect data on the actual strength of the German defence on the Western Front. If it succeeds and the result is favourable, I will get the strongest argument in favour of opening a second front. How many divisions will the German command will be forced to hastily withdraw from the Eastern Theatre of War and transfer to the Western Theatre of War, in order to strengthen the line of defence here in the event of the opening of a second front? To calculate all this, I had such possibilities. With the consent and full support of the head of the second department, I decided not to sit idly by waiting for the heavy days of the approaching offensive, when the Germans would be the first to attack the Soviet defences, because then it would be too late, too late to analyse the missed opportunities.
Only evidence of the weakness of the defense of the Western Rampart, only strong arguments for the fact that now the most convenient situation for the landing of the Allies across the English Channel in Europe can bring real help to the Soviet Union in a difficult situation. I set to work. I had to study in detail the defense system of the German armies in the West, starting from Holland and ending with the Pyrenees. We then received quite complete information from our agent network, in particular from Switzerland. However, information about Hitler's forces in France came spontaneously, disorderly, irregularly. Sometimes it was difficult to determine when and whether the necessary information would arrive. Therefore, it had to be purposefully requested and sent, accompanied by precisely defined requirements and checked and qualified again and again. The messages received had to be evaluated, analysed and finally synthesized. The most important thing were the conclusions. All this Sisyphean labor was done for their sake. Operational and strategic conclusions, which I arrived at after several months of work, were set out in a 30-page report and gave an unequivocal answer to the question of the power of the Western Rampart. They shook to the core the thesis of its insuperability and eloquently testified to the serious weaknesses of the stretched coastal defense system. It turned out that after the Battle of Moscow, the operational density of the Rampart defense fell sharp. Some divisions of the first echelon had even 90-kilometer sections of defense. Losted in its numerical composition of low-power divisions, transferred here from the east, were characterized by extremely low combat effectiveness. The troops fell morale, lack of weapons. Operational reserves were still weak. Strategic reserves were not available at all. They had already been brought into the fighting in the east. Long-term fortifications were not completed. Such was the strategic concept of the Rampart defense. The received information allowed us to draw conclusions about the quality of commanders. The detailed study of the Rampart, when we had to deal with individual divisions and corps, did not reveal anything. Of course, there were also white spots, which could not always be solved. However, we tried to reveal many inaccuracies by means of conclusions and comparisons. There were, of course, more important sources of information about the state of defense in Western France but our voice from Bayswater also sounded convincing. The new facts collected in one document made a strong impression. When I later, one spring day, handed the report to the Soviet military attache, he, after perusing it carefully, the Soviet Union will never forget this. The report, signed by Colonel Moravec in 11 copies, was handed over to the intelligence services of the Allied armies in London for further use. After the war, it, together with the archives of the 2nd Division of the Minnow in London, was handed over to the Ministry of the Interior in Prague. After the transfer of fresh reserves, particularly from France, the enemy regained the initiative lost in the Battle of Moscow. On 17 May 1942, Hitler's offensive in the south of the USSR began with the main blow in the direction of Kharkov, Voronezh. The Soviet defense was broken through over a large area. The enemy penetrated to the Don and made its way along the river to Stalingrad. The world was numbed in horror, with the Soviet troops hold back the terrible onslaught. The spectre of catastrophe kept people awake. The fate of Europe was on the scales. The military situation of the Soviet Union was worsening. There was a direct threat that the enemy would reach the Volga and Cuban and seize all communications leading to the Caucasus, along with the most important economic area of the USUR. And now, in the period of the highest danger, it was the right time to open the second, Western. I finished my comprehensive report on the Wehrmacht defense system in the West with the following phrase. Now the most favorable conditions have been created for the invasion of Europe through the Channel. The arguments in favor of this were in my favor. However, the Second Front was not opened in 1942, and the gigantic burden of the struggle against the Nazis fell entirely on the shoulders of the heroically fought people of the great country of the Soviets. Why? Because on 11 November it was possible to send a large landing fleet around France to the remote shores of Africa, and the Allied troops, advancing at a snail's pace, without a strategic impact on events on the Eastern Front, were already approaching the south of Italy. The invasion of France, through the exsanguinated Western Rampart, also lay within the real possibilities, especially since the situation in 1942 promised the greatest benefits. On 3 October 1942, Stalin, in answers to questions from the Moscow representative of the Associated Press, Henry Cassidy, reminded the Allies that they must fully and timely fulfill their obligations to open a second front.
At that time, Allied preparations to seize North African shores were in full swing. North African shores, and this at a time when the position of the German defence of the Western Rampart was deteriorating sharply. Shortly after the end of the war, I was at a reception in the Kremlin, in St. George's Hall, together with the Minister of National Defence, General Ludwig Svoboda, when Stalin raised his glass and looking at us. Nazdar. I remembered at that moment my vain efforts to accelerate the opening of the Second Front to help the Soviet people and the words of the Soviet military attach in London, with which he appreciated them. A reception given by the Soviet government to celebrate the victory was held on 25 May 1945. Piccadilly interviews. In the autumn of 1942, on the Eastern Front began the hard fighting for the approaches to Stalingrad. In October, heavy fighting was already going on in the city itself and in its immediate vicinity. At this time, the Soviet command was preparing a counter-offensive in the Stalingrad area. On 19 November, the troops of the Stalingrad, Don and Southwestern Fronts went on the offensive, which on 2 February 1943 ended with encirclement and destruction of the 6th Army of Field Marshal Paulus. The defeat at Stalingrad turned into a catastrophe of enormous strategic proportions. Hitler's troops lost offensive capabilities, the balance of power began to change in favour of the Soviet Union. After the defeat of German troops and their satellites in the Volga, Don and North Caucasus, the enemy, having suffered huge losses, retreated 500 kilometres to the west. 1943 was a year of great strategic successes of the Red Army. In the summer of this year, the enemy was preparing to take revenge for the defeat at Stalingrad in the Kursk area. On the Kursk bulge, it was planned to encircle and destroy up to 10 Soviet armies. On 5 July, the enemy went on the offensive. When he exhausted his striking force, the Soviet troops launched a powerful offensive, during which the fascist troops in the area of Kursk, Oral and Kharkov were defeated, and the strategic initiative finally passed to the Soviet command. The liberation of Kharkov on 23 August 1943 ended one of the significant battles of the Great Patriotic War. During the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942-V3, and the Great Summer Battles of 1943, the Second Department of the Ministry of Defence in London was intensively active. Many reports were received here which were of a nature to be considered by the research team. They were evaluated and analysed here. I recall one extremely important report, which we received in March 1943 from the German-Dutch Illegal Trade Union Organisations of Port Workers. This message concerned the preparations of the Germans for a major offensive operation on the Kursk bulge in the area of Oral and Kharkov. This message, with my conclusions, was immediately received by the Soviet military attache, Colonel Sizov, three and a half months before the actual start of the German offensive. I was satisfied with my work in the research group. However, as the war drew to a close, my anxiety grew. Would I never have to face the enemy in open combat? Such a prospect did not suit me at all and one unexpected event came to my rescue which resolved everything at once. At the end of 1943, I was suddenly transferred from the second department to the so-called headquarters for the construction of the armed forces. This headquarters dealt with the preparation of the army for the fulfilment of post-war tasks. When I left Bayswater, Colonel Moravec did not even say goodbye to me. What happened? Why am I being disposed of in such an unusual way? I mused. My sudden transfer took place in such a hurry that I did not even have time to say goodbye to the Soviet military attaché. After the war, at the first reception at the Soviet embassy in Prague, Sizov, our first Soviet military attaché, confessed to me that he was astonished at my sudden departure and vainly inquired where I had disappeared to. What would come of my new assignment? When I was informed of this, there was much to wonder. Believe it or not, they had given me a special map of Bruntal, and wanted me to deal seriously with the question of training camps in the Bruntal area in the post-war period. An extremely important task in that period. Nothing to say. From the realm of warfare and operational work, I suddenly entered the realm of the unreal military training camps in Czechoslovakia somewhere sometime. Some it became clear to me that my transfer was deliberate and my demotion was provocative. I decided to take action. As early as November 1943, I visited one day at 131 Piccadilly. Colonel Kalina and asked him to include me among those who were to be sent to a Czechoslovak unit in the east. After a negative reply, I submitted a similar report in writing to Colonel Vedral Sazersky, personally in his hands on 12 January 1944. 
I specifically stated that I was not applying for anything and wanted to command an artillery division in a position corresponding to my rank of lieutenant colonel. Colonels Morovec and sklenovsky Bozy stated that they objected to sending me to the Eastern Front. Why should they? Then Kalina offered me a place as commander of an artillery division in the 2nd Parachute and Airborne Brigade. They knew that such a commander was required to have parachute training. They knew that my lower limbs were not suitable for parachuting. That's why they offered it to me. However, the surgeon Major Novotny, at the military hospital in Hammersmith at my request, made me fit, albeit with some limitations, for field service in parachute units. Simply put, he operated on my legs. When I then fulfilled the established requirements and reported about it on 13 March 1944 to the appropriate department of the Ministry of Defence, a new obstacle arose. In the 2nd Brigade, they said, all the commanding positions were already occupied. Only the place of the commander of the Heavy Artillery Division was left. But that was exactly what I wanted. I immediately agreed and began to expect that I would be sent to the front in the near future. However, transport after transport took officers to the east, and I was not on the list. What could I do? I began to work defiantly with my sleeves up. I really did not want to resort to such a means, but what to do when there was no other way to achieve the goal? I pursued my tactics with such consistency that at last on my new report of 17 June General Miroslav Newman wrote the coveted word. Agreed, at last, but how long it took before I achieved it? Yes. A lot of water has flowed down the Thames since the moment when we entered British soil, and in Chumley Park, we were awakened for the first time by birdsong, although demoralisation was spreading in our camp. In the air battle for England, Czechoslovak fighter pilots shot down 56 enemy planes in a short time. From August onwards, blow after blow fell on England and London every day. Then it turned out that the worst of the whole war was without doubt the raid of 15 September 1940. I can't recall any other even slightly similar to it, and nothing like it, I experienced as I did that night. God knows how we ever managed to survive that and subsequent blows, but we realised that human fortitude can be the springboard to a new rise, and we paid the enemy for all his cruelties. I remembered how worried I had been at Porchester Gate when I joined the fight against Nazism with the sharp weapons of intelligence. Then came the 14th of September. I said goodbye to my tent, in which I had changed so many minds and listened to so many bitter words, and parted from the frowning Chumley Castle. On 10 May 1941, we were taking Milan to the hospital for bilateral suppurative inflammation of the middle ear. My voice broke with fear as I handed my son to the doctor. That morning Hitler's representative Rudolf Hess landed in England. I was stunned to hear about it and felt a smile appear on my face, for at that moment our victory was already assured. The entry of the Soviet Union into the war against Hitler gave us in Bayswater a new high. We breathed a sigh of relief. Now the active intelligence of our department was of great importance. I began to fight for the opening of a second front. What efforts were made at that time? When favourable reports came in and things were going well, I felt a sense of inner peace. Every evening, returning home in a rattling underground carriage, I thought about the same thing how to help the Soviet people most effectively in the struggle against the superior forces of the fascists. And with the same thought I travelled to work in the morning. Then came Stalingrad and Kursk, and the great hopes of mankind were realised in the grandiose victories of the Soviet armies. The years went by, messages of extreme importance passed through my hands and processed, went out again. And when the time came and I began to prepare for departure to the Czechoslovak part, I found that during all this time I had never recognised either England or London. In the autumn, when the tents had become damp and the ground frozen, the Czechoslovak brigade was transferred to a warmer garrison at Leamington. Endless sentries, alarms and anti-landing training in the 43rd year were replaced by garrison duty guarding the east coast. One thing that hadn't changed was the spirit of Piccadilly, the spirit of the Ministry of Defence. In London, I was afraid to enter the Ministry of Defence workrooms, especially the first, most bureaucratic department. When I was later transferred to the Armed Forces Construction Headquarters, life became unbearable. Memory after memory passed before my eyes. Was life in England idyllic? That depends. It didn't seem so to me. There were terrible things happening every minute, and I knew about them. Closing my eyes against all the horrible things I had to see, I was so 
at times withdrawn into myself that I did not notice some minor things that were far below the level of my consciousness. I used to talk out loud to myself at home. No, life in England was not idyllic. Then, when I was informed that I had been put on the list of transports to the East, I sat back in my chair with satisfaction and thought. Up to the time of my departure for the front I had been very much interested in the identity of the commander of the Sekia Slovak Eastern Unit to which I was travelling. I was not acquainted with General Soboda, but strangely. He attracted me with something. He seemed to me somehow close to my soul, although I had never seen him. Maybe it was because of his speeches, which I heard and read and which captured me. Behind them, and at a distance one could sense a big man. I often caught myself thinking of the commander of the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps in the USESA of the minute when I would look him in the eye. Before setting off on my long journey, I had many adventures with the German V1 rocket. When the British public was first introduced to this weapon of destruction on 7 June 1944, they could not immediately shake off the ghastly impression of a mechanical assassin pouncing on London. And although the enemy human pilot, endowed with a controlled will and full of fierce hatred in his heart, was even more merciless than a small unmanned Fei with a ton of explosives on board and a precisely measured range, people were frightened by the unknown. Where and when this terrible robot fall, flying adamantly along the trajectory given to it? It happened so that the Nazis put this weapon into use earlier than planned. The reason for this was the continuous bombing of their launching sites on the French-Belgian coast. At the worst times, several hundred flying bombs reached London every day. Where this robot fell, thousands of people died under the rubble of houses. The howling sound that accompanied the flight of the Fail U-1 kept millions of inhabitants in terrible suspense. Holding their breath, they waited for the end of the game with life. This spectacle played by the grunting monster. There was a thunderous bang, clouds of dust and smoke rose. Houses were turned into rubble. When the engine of the flying bomb stopped because of the lack of fuel, the robot descended to the ground in a planned flight, and even in broad daylight it was impossible to determine the place of its fall. The worst were those minutes in anticipation of death. However, the shock of the Fahu one was not long-lasting. This was taken care of by the British themselves, their stubborn and courageous nature. They accustomed themselves to perceive mortal danger fatalistically, as an element of everyday life. They went to work with it, to the shops, for a walk. Jet shells were destroyed from night to night by bombardment of launch pads. They were shot down by fighter planes over the English Channel and in the countryside in the south. The four ones were getting tangled up in barrage nets on the outskirts of London. One afternoon and we were listening from the top floor windows of the headquarters building near Hyde Park, trying to catch the direction of flight of two approaching flying bombs. We couldn't see them yet but from the sound it seemed as if one of the bombs was coming straight at us. Then we saw it. It seemed as if it would pass by, but in the last seconds we became speechless with fear. The bomb was coming straight at us, and moreover, it suddenly stopped humming and began to lose altitude rapidly. So the collision of Fowl one with our house was inevitably approaching. How stupidly people behave at such moments. We bounced against the wall, someone got under the table, someone ran out of the room. The robot flew close to the pipes of our building, and 200 metres away it exploded with a rumble at the very edge of the park. A deep crater was left in the ground. In the other wing of our building the explosion tore out all the window frames. At last the long-awaited hour had come, and I was preparing myself with hope for my imminent departure to my unit.